It's great to be with you all in this manner. And uh, yeah, what a, what a joy. I thought I would just introduce myself and share a little bit personally before I uh, share a little bit about today's reading. Um, as it was mentioned, I'm hailing to you all from Ananda, Portland, Oregon, and my name is Badri, and I serve uh, with the leadership team here as a spiritual director with Lorna Knox and a wonderful team of devotees and, and ministers, and we just have a, a beautiful community and, and work here. Um, I moved here just last summer um, from Ananda Village in California and spent almost 14 years uh, in residence there at the community at Ananda Village. Um, prior to that, I, I grew up in Southern California and I was involved with Self-Realization Fellowship. And, uh, you know, it's visiting with you all in this way now in Texas and having traveled a little bit around the world, it's always just a, a joy and a lot of fun, as many of you know from experience, to just connect with our Ananda brothers and sisters, and just with spiritual seekers everywhere, there is a sense of connectedness and unity that comes from just our shared um, seeking and support. And really, anywhere in the world, if you were to get on a plane today or just find yourself in, in Europe or India or South America, uh, there would be sort of the the devotee yellow pages that you could look up your your friends and show up at their door and they would have a little altar like yours and mine uh, where they would welcome you, you know, and, and they would feed you and, and take care of you just as, as we would for them. And that's just one of the very beautiful natural things about our path and the path is that when we just live for God, there's this shared sense of brotherhood and sisterhood and friendship that transcends all of the different you know religions and customs and countries and things that we get sort of boxed in with and so um even though it's it's sort of limited what we can do on on zoom and and so forth it is such a, a joy and a treasure nonetheless to connect with you all in this way and i did want to share too uh just briefly our move to ananda portland here last summer transpired after a relatively short uh, per transition period at Ananda Village, where my wife, Gita, as it was mentioned, and our two children, we have eight and 10 years old, Jay and Tulsi, um, were just at a transition period with school, with work, with you know life circumstances. And I was serving in community management at Ananda Village, and um, several of you will have visited there, I'm sure, and, and, and will visit there, I hope. Uh, it's one of the most special places in the world in this spirit of, you know, divine seeking and, and friendship and these things. And I wasn't really thinking of leaving Ananda Village ever uh, in particular. It wasn't really something I, I wanted or thought I, I needed. And yet... Um, Portland, Oregon, I guess, was calling to me on some level, and I came up here for a, actually a Sunday service like this as sort of a guest minister, and I saw that the community here and the the temple and the work really needed some help, and um, I did the most natural thing there is to do, and I asked Jodish and Davy, the spiritual directors of Ananda Worldwide, gee, aren't we going to do something to help Ananda Portland? And in the true spirit and fashion of Ananda and Swami Kriyananda, they said, sure, why don't you go up there? <laughs> and uh, as I said, there were there were certainly other circumstances um, that in time, as these things work out, unfolded to really be the best thing for all of the members of my family and, and for the community. And in a way, just after almost a year, we're just getting started, but the community and the temple and the Sangha here in Portland, Oregon is thriving in many ways and growing. And like Ananda's work everywhere, there are certainly challenges and ups and downs and things, but it's uh, all about serving and giving and giving. As Swami Kriyananda once said, Ananda is like a great tide or wave of energy of just loving and and joyful energy that just wants to give 
and give as long as there are people to receive. And there are many people, hearts and minds out there eager to receive what we have to, to share and, and give. And so that's our task is just to give and give. So it's again, just a, a joy to be together. I wanna thank you for, for hosting me and, and having me. And uh, yeah, look forward perhaps to being able to visit in person someday and, and all of that. Uh, and perhaps seeing some of you at the village for, for SRW coming up and so forth. So at any rate, I understand uh, it's my opportunity to share a little bit on today's Sunday service topic. And then I guess we'll have a little bit of questions and answers or some further discussion. So um, on to today's topic, which is everyone's not so favorite topic sometimes, why devotees fall. It could be a little bit of a depressing topic or something we don't want to get into, but uh, as with all the spiritual teachings and these wonderful kind of pithy topics that Swami Kriyananda gives us in the Ray's readings on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita, there are many facets to every teaching, like a gemstone that we can pick up and look at what they have to offer us. And just as all the teachings can be looked at in many different ways, and that truth can reflect light in, in many different ways, so too are we all changing. And so we can revisit these readings or the different spiritual teachings uh, every day, you know, every year frequently, and we can draw inspiration from them in, in new and different ways. So I think, I hope we won't go into too too deep or depressing of a, a topic today, but it is really important to look at this concept, at least, of how devotees fall. And what does it really mean to even to say that we fall? Because it's a perfectly natural and obvious thing that we do slip up, so to speak, spiritually and in our lives. Um, I was just this morning as these things happen i was getting my kids kind of ready for the day and they had a little mishap where uh younger brother jay attacked older sister tulsi in a not too threatening uh a sufficiently non-violent way but it, nonetheless it was an attack on sibling and rivalry and a little retaliation ensued and my son Jay, uh, after a little reprimanding, he pouted for a good good hour afterwards until he snapped out of it and were on with the day. But it was a good metaphor and a reminder for when we slip up, as again, we know the spiritual teachings of yoga teach us that it's really not the slipping up so much as it is our reaction that compounds to the mistake or the slip up or the error or the failure or what have you. And so there's this grandiose sense sometimes of our guilt or our shame or our failure, which really compounds to any so-called mistake that we make. Uh, there's an amusing little story I want to share with you about a couple of uh, devotees, three devotees that were in seclusion up on a high mountain peak. And as they sat there in deep quiet and interior meditation and yoga practice uh, for long periods of silence, uh, at one point a bird came soaring overhead and kind of swooped down low in a beautiful arc. And one of the yogis looked up from meditation and said, oh, look, a hawk. And a period of silence longer passed. And again, the bird swooped down in a beautiful arc and the other yogi there said, no, it's an eagle. And again, silence ensued and meditation and quiet. And finally, the third yogi spoke up and said, if you two keep fighting, I'm out of here. <laughs> and I, I realized that the jokes don't have the same effect for, for the teller on, on Zoom, but I'm, I'm assuming, I'm hoping I got a, a few chuckles and the amusement wasn't lost that there is sometimes this heightened sense and awareness in uh, spiritual community and in spiritual relationships and in our own spiritual lives that the effects of our actions and our thoughts and our behaviors can really feel magnified um, that, oh good, I see there's many chuckles there. 
um, that it does sometimes feel this way that our interactions are so, sort of gritty or, or, or magnified. And it's true that we have a, a karma with other people and that we're actually actively seeking to grow spiritually. And so we have to face that karma. Paramahansa Yogananda said that we have to fight the battle of life and achieve victory on the spot which we stand and that it's a victory of joy. But sometimes there is sorrow and there is even a, a drama that has to play out in our interactions with others and in our lives where, you know, as Yogananda has a beautiful and uh, deep song, uh, Lord, I will be thine always, one of his cosmic chants. It says that devotees may come and devotees may go, but Lord, I will be thine always. And through the different verses, through life and death, and as far as I may go in life, there has to be this commitment to seeking the self, to God, to self-realization, that no matter what comes, I will cling to God. And that's really the spirit that it takes and the ultimate kind of dedication of the spiritual path. And both on a sort of small day-to-day -day level in our meditation practice, and again, in our, our relationships and our work and our service, and in our lifelong, you know, heart's aspiration and commitment to see God above all else. There's another very beautiful story I want to share with you about a certain devotee who went into his guru's ashram, again, with this spirit of seeking God. And in fact, it was his would-be guru because he was seeking to be accepted into the ashram. And so he was the the master who he came to and fell at his feet, blessed him and, and took him in and said to the disciple, go and fetch some wood, some firewood and, and bring it to the ashram and heat the ashram. And this became the disciples work, his service day in and day out was to chop and to carry wood for the guru and for the ashram. And so he did this with a a good spirit of a disciple every day as part of his ashram duties and in his life until quite a long time had passed and unbeknownst to the disciple many years had passed and one day although he had come to the ashram as a young man he found that as he was carrying a bundle of firewood to the ashram a little of his long hair had been caught in the firewood in his arms and he saw that it was all gray and white and that he had now become an old man and in his despair he dropped the load of firewood and he began to weep and he said what has happened all these years have passed and i have only been carrying wood here at the ashram and as the tears began to fall to down his face the guru ran out to meet him to catch his tears and console him and told him that in his dedication, in his simple task of carrying wood all these years, that he was sanctified, that he in his spirit of discipleship and his spirit of service and commitment, not thinking of himself all these years, he said so great and so saintly had he become that even were one of his tears to fall to the ground that there would be a great famine upon the land. And this is the spirit of a true disciple who doesn't think of him or herself, but only thinks of serving others, as I was saying, and giving and giving and giving. And if there's one sort of spiritual teaching that sums it all up, it's not the most grandiose, perhaps, or it, it's rather simplistic. But it's something that I've learned from my time at Ananda Village and from my few years on this spiritual path is simply just to never, ever, ever give up the search, ever give up the love for God and for others. There are so many things that we could say, so many rich teachings and stories and examples on the spiritual path. But ultimately, if we give life our heart, our full heart, to God, 
then the success is ours. And surely we have to do the work day in and day out. But even Judas, as it says in the reading and in the life of Jesus, even Judas was liberated, Paramahansa Yogananda said. In fact, just in this last century, the ways of karma and these spiritual teachings can be strange, but Yogananda said that despite his uh, very real mistakes and falling spiritually, that Judas himself was liberated in this last century by a certain master in India, and that Judas's guru, of course, Jesus, came and sought liberation for his disciple after all those years. And so ultimately, God is a God of love. God is love. And our plan for our own hearts and souls is to be one with that love. And God surely made this world, including all of its sort of pitfalls. And so God isn't very surprised when we fall into them, but what happens next is up to us. And we can cling to the guru, Yogananda, for those of us that have embraced Kriya Yoga and discipleship, Yogananda is everything in the way that he represents God and can take us to God. And if nothing else, if all we do is cling to the hem of the guru, then that love and that unity and success in life will be ours. And there will be a great many things that come from there. But if we can remember this one, again, rather simplistic teaching to cling to God and the guru, no matter what comes, then we will get there. There's one more incidence from the life of Jesus I want to share with you, which is a very beautiful interaction with his disciples towards the end of his life. When again, Jesus was going through these periods of trial and his disciples, again, this karma, this drama was playing out that we know from the life of Christ. He spoke to the disciples and began to say things that were very difficult, including my flesh is the food and my blood is the drink and, and whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. And saying things like this was frightening to some disciples and followers and confusing. And he had amassed hundreds and, and thousands of followers at that point. And it says in the Bible that at this point in Jesus life that many began to turn away again, because of this confusion or doubt and because of this drama and this uncertainty. And Jesus said, after the disciples replied, this is a very difficult teaching that you're saying these things, who can understand it? And Jesus knew what was in their hearts and their minds. And he said, does this offend you? And he saw the disciples, as it says in the Bible, many followed him no more. And Jesus said, to his apostles, the 12, he said, will you leave too? Do you want to go away like the others? And it was Simon Peter, the disciple who spoke so beautifully the words simply and said, Lord, to whom would we go? Where else can we turn but to you, Lord, to their master, to their guru and to God? When a disciple, when a spiritual seeker has made that heartfelt commitment to seek God in their life and has the blessing of a true guru such as Jesus or Yogananda or any of the great ones, then where else can we turn? We can go seemingly here or there, but to no avail because we have given our hearts to God and to the guru into this path and there's simply no alternative even if we were to kid ourselves even if we were to go someplace else where could we go because god is omnipresent and god is love and we have given our hearts into that stream of love that will ever keep flowing into the great river of life the great river of love that ultimately flows into the cosmic ocean of God's infinite love. And so this is the prayer of the devotee and my humble offering to share with you all 
is that our hearts ever keep loving God and God and one another and all, and that we can just give our all in our lives, in our service, in our sharing, in whatever humble ways we can in our relationships and families and work, young and old and ups and downs, that we can just choose love, God's love, and that that love ultimately will make us free. I want to just close this little portion here by sharing with you a letter. Some of you will have heard this most likely, a very beautiful letter from Yogananda to one of his disciples. It's entitled, You Must Never Lose Courage. And it offers some very consoling words from the guru to the disciple, to each of us in a way. So just listen to these words from Yogananda as I share them with you and we take them into our hearts. Yogananda writes, Divine Mother sent me to pilot you out of the clouds of your mind. Everybody's difficulty is different and he or she has to win that test of karma and Divine Mother. Overcome all by constant inward calling on God and utmost devotion in words, thought, action, and obedience to the Guru. God does not talk readily to the devotee, but a Guru does. And the easiest way out of all difficulties is to listen to him and obey him. Your troubles I do not mind. I will never give up my job about you. It is better to conquer evil and not go on living with it forever. Never for a moment identify yourself with momentary flashes of error. Have no fear even when I am gone and no longer visible in your eyes. You will never be alone. I may not scold you then, but I shall ever be with you and through Divine Mother guard you from all harm and will constantly whisper to your guidance through your loving self. Do not make life discouraged and tired, but be ever, ever interested in doing for Divine Mother no matter if war, sickness, and death dance around you. That is the secret of victory over delusion and all troubles. Be cut to pieces, but never give up. Be a divine leech, suck at the blood of wisdom even through torn to bits. A smooth life is not a victorious one. And I will give you lots of good karma, so you will get through. I will not only ever forgive you, but ever lift you up, no matter how many times you fall. Keep unceasingly trying to conquer. Then not only will I invisibly help you, but visibly through many here, all whom know your inner self and love you very deeply. They all know what I think of your spiritual qualities. It is kindness and continuous good behavior that you shine with happiness. Divine Mother will help you to win through your own efforts and the blessings of the great gurus. I'm not building a mansion for you or giving you riches that will perish, but making an imperishable home with all riches for you in my Divine Mother's mansion. Unceasing blessings, Paramahansa Yogananda. Well, thank you, Baudry. I keep trying to bring the tears up to the spiritual eye here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is such a lovely way to end your talk and a, a beautiful talk so we really feel it all in our hearts and we thank you for sharing with us today and we want to invite everyone uh, online to also open up your cameras if you are willing um, because uh, it's always nice to see everybody's faces and a little more connecting if you're able to do that at least for a little while to to just say hi and to for us all to see you. So we are now going to open it up for Q&A, uh, satsang, and um, those online, you can also ask a question. Uh, you know, you can open your camera, ask it, put it in the chat, however you're, you're comfortable with here in the Sangha house. Uh, you're welcome to come to the microphone and ask a question. So we'll just see if anybody's Got a pressing question right now, and I've got go one. With you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I've okay. got two in Houston. Oh, from Houston. Hi, Badri. Hi, Joel. Thank you for today. It was really beautiful, as as Maitri mentioned. 
um, and I was thinking about a question and I realized that um, I read a blog recently from Jyotish that really resonated with me. And in that blog, he asked three questions. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to steal one of those questions and ask you. Um, and the one that I selected was, what What was your best day? What was your <laughs> best day? Yeah, I read the blog too, and I enjoyed it. So I cheated a little on my homework, <laughs> or Divine Mother helped me cheat. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I appreciated the, the blog and the questions. I think it was an interviewer that asked them. But actually, for me, what immediately came to mind as my sort of best day is, you know, there's sort of sentimental or nostalgic feelings that come up around that. But to me, it did happen on a particular day in, in June of uh, 2009. So let's see, 15 years ago. Um, but it wasn't so much this specific date as it was a symbol of this day when I took a formal uh, vow of discipleship to Paramahansa Yogananda. Um, I had already made that deep commitment in my heart for a few years and perhaps probably for many lifetimes, as I believe we all have in some way or another. Um, but for me, what that day in, in June on a little hilltop at Ananda village with a few friends and with Nayaswami Ananta and Maria, for those that know them, uh, to me represents, uh, as I've been saying a bit, the commitment to seek God above all else through the Guru as it's given in our path. And similarly, I, I kind of hold and treasure most dear both the discipleship uh, I'll say the initiation or the ceremony itself, but again, I would say mostly of all, it's the symbol of our giving our hearts to the guru um, and the twin sort of initiation of Kriya initiation, um, which again is a technique. It's a, a thing that happens on a given day in a given place, as most of you all know, and many of you have probably done, but more than that, it's hand in glove with the disciple guru relationship is the Kriya practice. And so these two days, if you will, and just this one day for me of discipleship, which typically chronologically comes first, it represents the the most glorious day of our set little self before God. And for me, I, I treasure that, that memory of that day, but more than anything, that feeling in my heart of just giving God, you know, everything I have, everything I am, on the altar of my own heart and and doing you know my best since then to to live that out to the fullest yeah awesome Beautiful. thank you so much thank you for uh, the question. along those lines Badri, maybe and you probably did this when you came on many years ago but i can't yeah. remember um i'd love to hear a little bit about you know how you did come onto the path and ended up at ananda it, it would be it's always a joy to hear that yeah. story yeah, I'll, I'll just try to be succinct as these things go. I don't have, there's some pretty, pretty awesome stories out there. I don't have the Hollywood story, although I am from, from Southern California. Um, my mom actually gave me autobiography of a yogi. I was 17 years old and I was getting it real into Hatha yoga at the time, just to, you know, yoga posture practice, which also really awakened in me a uh, desire for, for meditation and spirituality. But I didn't know much or have any religious or spiritual background uh, consciously in, in my early life. And so, but that book just set me on fire and I, I gave it to my brother um, who, who was a year older than me. And we were living together at the time. Um, I'm starting to go to college and I went to Self-Realization Fellowship because that was the publisher of that particular copy of Autobiography of a Yogi. And we we went to the temples and we did the lessons, the SRF lessons that most of you know. So we did that for a couple of years and we're really devoted in our little practice and in our attending of the SRF services and things. And then one summer, uh, a couple of years later, 2009, as I said, I found a program at Ananda Village just online that uh, a friend of mine of ours, Nabha, had put a little 
ad <laughs> online for. And I went straight there with my brother to Ananda Village. And at that point, I just never looked back. Um, the discipleship came soon after in Kriya Yoga to follow. But for me, it represented the full circle of, of homecoming, you know, to the guru. And as I said, for me, I have a deep connection with Ananda Village as a place and a very, very special place for me. And a uh, place I think of as home, but having moved and now living in a place like Portland, Oregon, or, or being in Texas, uh, you know, I know, Atul, you've traveled around a bit, you know, the Ananda world. The more we mature, I think, and grow and expand our world spiritually, and even in a sense, physically, God is our home everywhere in our hearts and, and wherever we need to be according to our, our circumstances, our life, our karma, um the the dharma of a given situation and so yeah for me 14 years at ananda village i met my wife and we started a family i i served in numerous ways there um but it you know was that homecoming most of all as i said in that path of discipleship and that day that really just brought me home to to god and then it's a lifelong adventure, a spiritual, you know, fun adventure from there, a journey to see where it leads. So I'm still on the journey, on the adventure with you all. The, the follow up to that is uh, twofold. One is what compelled your mother to give you that book? Being a mother, you know, you're always thinking about that. And then the other thing is, is just, um, uh, you know, we, and this is more of a comment, we, we're always, for just the reasons you said, uh, encouraging people who have never gone to the village. It can be a, a pivotal, life-changing event, even if we've been on the path for many years, um, to just go there and uh, soak in that vibration that is so strong and it's such a, a beautiful place. So, But back to that other, yeah. uh, who called your mom? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think God must have compelled her. I don't know what else I should go back and ask her. She's, she's a, I would say, a, a spiritual person, not in a really overt or uh, strongly committed to a certain path um, way. But um, she had read the book actually as a youth herself. And um, again, I, as I mentioned, I was getting real into Hatha Yoga practice. And honestly, I don't think she had any clue what this wasn't the copy, but what this was going to do to to me and to my life and my brother who became a disciple in a Korea bond too. But uh, I really, I mean, what else can we say except the Divine Mother inspired her to to give that to me. Uh, I think it, it touched her as a youth. At, she didn't make the level of commitment that I made, but she's always been supportive of me, of us, and um, I think deeply appreciative of the spiritual path and of my own commitment to it and to share it. Um, and so, yeah, what what can we say looking back in our lives, except that Divine Mother orchestrates the different moving parts. And sometimes there's a little understanding or insight into what, you know, motivations she had or she implanted in, in different people and circumstances. But ultimately, we're all like the kitten that Divine Mother picks up, like the Harry Mahashai said, by the scruff of the neck and just puts down in the appropriate place according to the mother's wishes. So, um, yeah, and to echo your your sentiments, I don't think that was a question, but for anyone that can visit Ananda Village or some time in residency there, you know, whether temporary or otherwise, uh, there's, there's no place like it. Uh, on the planet. There are many, many very special and sacred places and communities and ashrams and, and pilgrimage sites, but Ananda Village is all of the above and more. And um, just an absolute treasure for, for everyone and for the, the committed people in our path to, to really take advantage of. So yes, by all means, make an effort to go there regularly if, if you can and, and draw inspiration online from there and support just in reciprocal way every opportunity we can with, with respect to Ananda Village. Okay. So how about, uh, is there anybody here in the room that has a question? Anything. It can be about anything. But oh, Mark is coming forward. Is Mark coming forward? Hi, Baudry. 
I hope you can hear me okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Um, I just wondered, outside of the core practices of Kriya Yoga, is there something that you particularly like to do to kind of keep your motivation going and to keep your spiritual tank full? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there are a number of things outside the core practices, you know, um, but for me, uh, I would say the thing that comes to mind is um, practicing the presence of God and the primary ways that I do that because we can only meditate for whatever it is, an hour or two or so every day, um, is to feel that God is the doer in, in every activity. And for me, uh, simple exercise, because I am an energetic and often a restless person, is just to chant Om Guru. You know, some people would ask Swami Kriyananda, sort of, do we have a mantra on this path? Because some gurus will give a mantra or will, you know, traditionally use some mantra, not like Hong Sa, which is a huge mantra in meditation, but for us to recite over and over like Japa or as a spiritual practice. And Swami Kriyananda said, no, we don't really have a mantra. Yogananda did not give a mantra. But if we were simply Om Guru is the mantra because Om is the cosmic sound, as we know, is the sound of God. Simply chanting it, as it says in the Bhagavad Gita, mentally thinking Om, meditating on Om, you know, chanting Om. I keep the Om playing in my car all the time or right here on my computer all the time at home. Um, it keeps us in the presence of God. It has a tremendous power and effect. Um, and add to that Guru, which again, just like that day of you know, my date of discipleship, the word guru is impregnated with our own hearts and through eternity with the image, not just of Yogananda, but of the Sat Guru, who is one with God and can bring us to Om, to the spirit. So I just chant Om Guru all the time, every day, as often as I can. And um, yeah, I, I think there are many other things that we all have to sort of wow. develop in our tool belt. But for me, uh, practicing God's presence and chanting Om Guru is, is foremost. Okay, I just realized that I'm not on camera. <laughs> there you are. Good Can question. Thank you. I'm stand over I here. pressed the wrong button. Anyway, thank you very much. Thanks. Right. Anybody else here in the room want to come up to the mic since the camera's now out <laughs> in that sense? No? Online? Any questions in the chat box? Or I can't see the chat, so. Uh, Hugh just says, beautiful talk. Thank you for being with us, Padre. Okay. Oh, I have one more question. <laughs> get on camera. <laughs> I'll get on camera. Uh, I just, the, uh, the letter from Yogananda that you read, uh, I just wonder what, what the source for that is. Uh, you know, it's, it's in the published works from Self-Realization Fellowship. I believe it's to Ananda Mata. You can easily look it up uh, just on Google or um, it's on the Ananda Library for those that ha have access. Again, it's entitled, you, you Must Never Lose Courage. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a personal letter to a disciple that was later published. And may I say, I have, I have it digitally and I can email it to anyone if you text or email me. That, yeah. I mean, you can maybe search for it as we well. We have but... a copy at home too. Okay. I, I kept it by my in my meditation space when I used to sit on the floor. That was with the olden days for me. And um, it was always there. And I read it either before I meditated or after. Or it's sometimes beautiful. if I got restless, yeah. I read it. Yeah. And then it, so it's it, it's a great one. And oh, I was so touched beautiful. that you yeah. read it. Yeah. Hi, Hugh. Have... Another one? No, 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 no. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. Somebody else want to uh, online? Yes, I, hear... I, I have a question, please. Oh, um, you. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, Padre. I'm with the Ananda Sangha house, uh, currently at home. Uh, I was curious about uh, Portland, Oregon, because we've had Lorna here a couple of times as a guest minister and also in person when we had a center elsewhere in Addison. But uh, as centers change over time, and I was just curious, do you uh, do you have a living community there, like 
three months Seattle? Oh, yeah. Do you have in Palo Alto? What's it like? When, you know, can you share a little Absolutely. bit about that? Yeah, happy to. Thanks for asking. Yeah, we have a beautiful community here, really um, very similar to those of you that know to Seattle, Sacramento and Palo Alto in particular. Those three and ours, uh, those these four communities all have a residential physical community that is essentially a, a glorified apartment complex that we've you know, transform for master. And they're actually quite lovely, all four of them. If you haven't had a chance to visit, I, I really encourage it. Um, and then they all have a, a temple and teaching center of some kind or another. Qu again, quite impressive and, and beautiful temples that at various times have included a living wisdom school of some kind or um, businesses that, again, may be at another site nearby, but Ananda businesses such as East West bookstores or um various things so but primarily the temple and teaching center which we have here in a suburb of portland called beaverton and then about 10 minutes away is the residential community here in rally hills portland area um and yeah both are, are just very beautiful places um we'd love to have guests so we'd love to host anybody even if we're just passing through um but but i strongly encourage everyone as i was saying at the outset to, to visit all the ananda communities if you can all around the world again circumstances and expenses and things are all a factor but it's deeply inspiring to to stay connected and see the different expressions of master's work and yes at the core of of his mission was this idea of spiritual community and again, Ananda Village is a magnificent and very unique and, and special expression of that. Um, and as are not to a greater or lesser degree, but in a different way, as are these four communities, as is Los Angeles, Assisi, Italy, the various centers in India. And, and again, not greater or lesser, what you all are doing there in, in Dallas and in Texas is, is a spiritual community for master. And again, none are greater or lesser. They're all of the utmost importance because we're fostering this sense of, of connection and the spirit of, of cooperative community, of support, seeking God together, of serving God together. Um, so it's it's right at the top. And yeah, we have a, a beautiful community here that, as I said, has um, been through some some growing pains with with COVID, as we all were, and, and various things. Uh, the Ananda Center at Laurelwood, which some of you know about, that sort of went under a few years ago. But but we really are in a, a growth period here. We've got a beautiful uh, community. It's got about 100 or so residents. And then our, our temple and teaching center with a small living wisdom um, preschool and uh, beautiful sanctuary and, and temple and, and teaching center there. So yeah, very special community and, and love to host you, anyone for a visit if, if you can make it happen. But so the, the follow-up to that, Rodri, is um, that I saw in your your newsletter a little while back, and I don't know if it's still true, but you actually have some apartments open, and you were looking for a maintenance person. Is that still true? Why, yes, it is. Thank you for, for mentioning it. Yeah, um, we're, we're looking at hiring some folks and new residents coming in. Um, there's always some of this transition happening at a given time and we're going we've been going through a period of moderate to, to major transition um but yes we still do need help with the maintenance in the community here and um also have some apartments we're down to one or two apartments open but as i said that um frequently will be in transition so yeah we're we're always looking to grow and expand and change and yeah the maintenance role is a, a wonderful way to serve so definitely yeah. for for you or anyone you may know again that we all keep our our minds and hearts open to the the different possibilities of how we can serve of where we go and what we do and that it's all for master so um yeah thank you for bringing that up there's, there's still yeah. opportunities please inquire I I bring I bring that up because you know and Lorna may have told you that uh, you know Mark and I toyed for years about well we were we were involved a little bit with Laurel and we used to bring our son up there for family camps and we 
I'm from the Northwest. That's where I came on the path too, not from Portland, but from Seattle. And we we toyed with for years about going up there. And and, uh, and I saw all that, and it's like, oh, and we're in, Mark and I have been in personally in a lot of transition too. And so it's like, oh, is that still? You know? <laughs> but I'm not saying that. Don't want to panic anybody here. But we yeah. always well, think about. Okay. Always good to be open to whatever Divine Mother has in mind. Well, right. And, and, and I will say the Portland community, I've, I've stayed there in the community as well um, in the guest the guest room that uh, that you had. I don't know if that's still the yeah. same. Oh, yeah. But um, it's a beautiful little community. And Beaverton is very nice. It's, um, it's, it's one of my favorite ones, having visited all of them. And, and, and I always felt a real sense of connection to everybody in Portland. It's just wonderful. And Lorna's like a, you know, she's one of my spiritual sisters, uh, just a dear, dear friend. So, but yeah, I, I think people should come visit. And I just wanted to put that plug in there, too. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, Mallory, did you want to ask a question? You, um, I just with well, one thing I wanted to clarify: where you had apartments open, Sacramento or Portland? No, Portland. Portland. Oh, yeah, here, here in Portland, we we have some openings in the community, and um, I wouldn't be surprised if they do in in Sacramento too. It's it's the nature of the thing, as I said, that you know every spring or fall or any given time, you know, one or two units may open up, people transition. We had four or five open up in the last few months. So as I said, it was a, a fairly major transition. They're mostly filled. We have one or two still still sort of pending. Um, but yeah, change is good. We embrace it and ride the wave. And um, yeah, there's, as I said, please inquire anyone about a visit or a possible residency or anything, we're wide open. So yeah. I spent time in Sacramento when there was a woman there who she had to go to Canada for six months. So mm -hmm. she would rent out her apartment. So I uh -huh. three weeks there was wonderful. Very nice. Yeah. It's a beautiful community as well. And where I'm familiar with all the flexible arrangements we make to accommodate divine mothers, various children and in various forms of community. So very nice. The other question I had was uh, Darshan was here recently Mm -hmm. And I asked him this question, I thought I would ask you, um, how do I, what's the best way that you've experienced to develop devotion? And he, his answer was, um, before you meditate, always commit it to God, always commit your meditation to God. Um, and I know chanting is the other thing, but I don't yeah. have a podium, but I probably need, you know, to get more um, things. Yeah. I have a the player in my car I could get more yeah. right right yeah I I would say building on the chanting thing for me that's my um first hit and my sort of primary way although there's many is um is chanting and, and music and not to limit it to the idea that I have to have a harmonium or play a harmonium which I would absolutely encourage you to do um if if at all possible but yeah the cd in the car the Ananda Music uh, radio app on your phone or on your browser. Yeah. Um, uh, singing, the Ananda songbook is magnificent. Uh, learn, pick up the guitar and, and finger around a few chords to, to learn something new. Uh, a ukulele, uh, a cappella. Uh, <laughs> I mean, just, I, I can't tell you enough um, not to limit it to Yogananda's chants, which are incredible, very powerful his cosmic chants, and, and how he said chanting is half the battle, um, but all the Ananda chants and the various ways we can listen to them. As I said, playing the Om uh, vibration, the, the sound Swami chanting Om, it's an hour and 10 minutes on a loop. You know, I, I would listen to NPR, listen to chants and things in the car, and I finally just said, you know, there's only one thing I want to listen to. I just play Om all the time in the car. Um, so just whatever whatever way you can and that inspires you but but to take advantage of that stuff and to, to what end right to devotion to to being able to love god more and and not to limit it to ourselves that it's only when i'm chanting and going into meditation and, and loving god of course that is at the, the essence what it is but all the time to be loving and seeking and serving god as i say I'd be chanting Om Guru constantly. It's often in the form of the chant, Om Guru, which is to the tune of Om Kali, 
but it's not always, it's just as much as possible. Sound is vibration. So how can I use the chants, the Ananda music, um, the Om recording, whatever it is to always be tuning in to this loving God, to this, you know, God's infinite love. So I would take advantage of, of the music and chanting in, in every possible way. Okay. Anything in the chat, Mark? No. Okay. Anybody else online or in person? We're about to approach the, the, the noon hour, which is when we typically close, but we want to give everybody an opportunity to uh, ask a question or comment. Um, sure. I have, I have one more thing before Badri leaves. Um, yeah, you, uh, you're part of the Guru Bhakti Brothers uh, duo, <laughs> correct? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I just uh, it just popped into my mind um, when you're talking about chanting. I, I, it's one of my favorite. Those recordings are. I have the Nanda radio on all the time. It's it's a really wonderful tool. I put it on at work when I'm working. When the kids are going to work as a teacher, yeah. or um, driving home or going there, and your your duets with Ramesh are one of my favorites. Um, just beautiful, um, um, Bob and and the devotion and the chanting. Uh, just really comes off, and I was wondering. Uh, but now that you're in Portland, are, are you still going to be working with Ramesh? Or will there yeah. be any further recordings? Yeah, that's, just that's like great. Thank you for saying that. We we yeah, I really appreciate it, and um, we do kind of try to keep the spirit of it alive. And and we'll uh, Ramesh and I will do some more chants at some point, um, e e recording or YouTube or whatever. Um, it's just something that um, we both have a deep a friendship and and love of of chanting and and the guru that we like to share together in that way. I think he and I both we get get this fairly frequently and it's kind of our running joke that the the guru bhakti bros thing precedes us wherever we go. Um, we I think he and I both cr sort of cringe a little bit. He's made some magnificent recordings recently, and he's a, obviously this gifted classically trained musician and all these things. Um, I'm a little bit more self-taught, humble, you know, devotee chanting for God over here. And uh, we made those recordings sort of early on with various mm, moderate quality or poor uh, audio video equipment and stuff. And so <laughs> all the quality and stuff isn't the best. But as you say, the, the devotion and the Bob is there. And um, that's really at the heart of what we strive to offer. And so, yeah, most recently, a few years ago, we recorded a few Spanish chants, actually, uh, mm -hmm. at request of the, the Spanish, Ananda Spanish ministry. And um, we had a lot of fun doing that. And yeah, we eagerly look forward to, to doing some more chants together. It'll happen. I, I don't know when, but he just actually texted me this morning and uh, I'm really looking forward. I'll see him for, you know, spiritual renewal week at the village in a few weeks. And surely we'll get to plotting for when we can do some more, more chanting and sharing in that way. Good. Yeah. Glad. Where, where can we find those Spanish ones? Oh, they're online. Yeah. Just YouTube Guru Bhakti Bros. And uh, yeah, um, you should be able to just find them in a playlist on our YouTube page. But okay. um, yeah, poke around and email me if you can't find it. We'll get you there. Okay. All right. Anybody else? And the um, what? Just, just, um, the om? Yes. Swami's om. Swami chanting om okay. is on YouTube. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we can just uh, wrap this up now. We, again, so grateful that you came on. Please give our love to, to Gita and your family, rest of your family, and our spiritual family in Portland. Um, and, uh, you know, some of you, some some pe folks may see you at SRW. I wish we could be there. We're not going to be there. But at any rate, uh, we thank you so much for joining us today. And in uh, closing, we offer you our, um, an our, our very specific Ananda, Texas goodbye. So again, if you want to open your cameras, we'll all just bring our hands to the heart. We'll do what we'll chant on, and then I think those here in the room at least know what follows that. So, so let's just chant on, sending out those waves of uh, 
gratitude to Madri and uh, and his time spent with us today. And namaste. <laughs> Thank you again. A great day. God bless everybody. Bye, 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 Bye,